that takes a good two, three hours, four hours, just that mm. process. Um, it's more about creating a safety, create, creating a safe place. It is recognized syndrome among photographers. Today on the Engaging Marketeer, I am interviewing photographer Laura Shimley. Laura started photography when she was a student in Paris and now works and lives in London as a professional photographer specialising in headshots, branding and portraits. Uh, I talked to Laura about how you take the photographs, how you pose for the photographs and what happens when someone like me, who doesn't like having their picture taken, needs a photograph for their business. One thing I, I, I'd like to ask with people who do a, a creative role like yourself is what actually sparked that interest in in the role you do now where did your interest in photography first come from um right so it's a bit of a long story but i guess all of these have a bit of a long story <laughs> um so i am from albania originally and i went to study in france in paris when i was um 18. nice so, that was uh, quite an experience going from a very small country um, coming out of communism um, to Paris, uh, the city of lights and beautiful settings. So I went to study economics there, uh, but I also uh, bought a camera and started taking photos of the streets, of people, uh, of friends, and that's how it really started. That was the first time that I felt that photography um, could help me with my creative, as a creative outlet. Hmm. So what what was the, the camera that you first bought then? But what, what year, actually, if you say what year that was, that tells you what, how old you are and that's not cool. Uh, <laughs> fine, I can, I can let that out. It's it was about 10 years ago, I'm sure. <laughs> a bit more than that, double that. <laughs> Uh, that was back in 20, um, sorry, that was back in 1999. <laughs> right, 1999. I, I remember yeah. it, unfortunately, far too well. <laughs> so what, what sort of camera was it that you bought for the um, first time? So the first camera I bought was a Canon, and it was a film. It was an analog um, camera, mm -hmm. so digital cameras were just coming in. Uh, I had the option of buying a, a digital one, um, but I chose to buy an analog one, a film one, uh, because I wanted to, well, I didn't know. I just went with that and um, I did actually enjoy the film, um, you know, learning about film, buying films, hmm. uh, developing them and um, also spend hours, some hours in a dark room, learning how to actually process the film and how to uh, develop it. Hmm. So how did you get access to the dark room? Because that, that's unusual for people who came into photography at that time to be using film. Mm. Um, so it was through a student, um, a student squat. <laughs> <laughs> of course. A, there you go. In a student squat, they had a basement. And in the basement, there was a dark room uh, that was available for people to mm. use. Um, not many people were keen to use it. So it wasn't very hard to get uh, mm you know, to get access to that. And um, I, I had someone explain how it worked and what chemicals you need to use, which tray you need to use, and how to, num how to make sure that it doesn't completely um, become blank, completely you know, wiped out. Mm. Um, so, so yes, yeah, so that, was, that was the process and the place. Mm. And when you were using a darkroom, so I've done that myself on a, I did a film and photography degree. And it was about that time as well. It was about 1998, I think, we graduated. So we were, we were probably doing it about the same time. Everything we did was film. And then as soon as we graduated, digital cameras came in and all the technical stuff that we'd learned was useless. So how important do you think it was for you to learn how to do it on film and develop the film yourself to then do photography with a digital camera afterwards? Um, I think the, the developing part, like the developing the film part, um, wasn't as much um, technically important in the sense of giving me many technical skills, but it does give you the, the ability to see things before they're developed mm -hmm. in a way. Um, so that, that is sort of part of how maybe a technical mindset or a technical understanding rather than a, spe you know, a specific skill because... Well, although, you know, when you develop in Lightroom now, it's a different process. I use Lightroom and Photoshop to edit. So some things will be similar, like contrast and highlights and shadows. 
Um, so it, I guess it's part of, it contributes to your understanding of the technical side of photography. Hmm. No, I, I agree. I think it is a useful skill to, to do, and, and anyone doing photography, if they can, should have a go at it just to hmm. see how the actual the film develops and how the paper develops because seeing the photograph appear in the chemical tray in front of you, yeah. there's just something magical about that, yeah. I think. That bit is definitely when you see it actually taking shape and it actually revealing the image coming through and you're still in the dark room, you can't see it very well. So once it's finished, then looking at it in the light confirms, you know, what you could see at first. But um, it is like just, just that appearing is it's a nice, um, it's a very... Uh, a magical thing, indeed. Yeah, I, I can still remember the smell of the chemicals <laughs> as well. <laughs> so, what was what was Paris like to photograph? Well, Paris was amazing. Um, when I first got there, I was um, obviously I was coming from I was on my own. I didn't. Um, I moved from Clermont-Ferrand, which is in the centre of France, to Paris myself. So I had um, family in Clermont-Ferrand, but I wanted to. Be myself on my own so i moved away and i didn't know anyone i had some albanian friends uh, common friends uh, but most of the time i was on my own so i i used the camera to just go and photograph things and and use my time um and it was beautiful i used to love especially at like a uh, dawn time um mm. dawn i'm not sure if it's dawn um before sunset dusk dusk Dusk, Dusk time Dusk. is my favorite. Uh, when the light is, you know, just very soft, and the uh, you have the Seine, the river, and you have the banks of the uh, along the river. I used to love walking on those banks um, and just observing people. And there was um, a poetic, I don't know, something in the streets of Paris, and <laughs> it was beautiful. Uh, the buildings, the history, the culture, the language, the music, uh, the food, and the smells, and um, me being, you know, completely from a different world, observing all of that was uh, was powerful. Was very powerful. You sound like you miss it quite a bit, actually. <laughs> I do actually. And I was. Uh, we were in uh, April. We were there in April um, with my family. Spent um, ten days there, and I was very happy to be able to show my children the exact um, banks that I used to walk um, <laughs> in, and the bridges that I used to cross, and. The, the the island in the middle of Paris, um, Ile Saint Louis, and um, the different statues that I remembered very well. So yeah, but I've been regularly. I've been, you know, I mm. do go regularly, and mm. we're so close in London. So yeah, yeah, it's not far, is it? It's not far. <laughs> so when you went from 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 Paris, what was your next step into professional photography? Then how, how long did it take, and, and where did you go? Um, so it was a bit of a process that as well because. Um, from Paris, then I went back to Albania, um, where I started working um, with my degree in economics, and I also did a, a master in philosophy of economics. So I started working in public policy, um, so nothing to do with photography, and photography was still on the side. Um, and then I started taking part in like competitions about Tirana and street photography in Tirana. Mm. Um, so that was keeping it, you know, keeping it going. Then I met my husband who is English, who was working in Tirana and we moved to London. We had our first child, first baby. And that's when I started doing more photography, more regularly every day with my camera. And I started considering that maybe I could do this for other people. Hmm. And, and how much of a big step was that um, going So that from? was a big step, that yeah. took, so from that moment, um, so my son is now 11, um, so from, so yeah, 11 years to get to where I am now in, ter in terms of um, accepting it, giving it a go, and I went on to courses. So I started doing more regular uh, learning, so I went on to a digital course, um, one of those 12-week um, things, I finished that, and then I went on to studio lighting, um, newborn, headshots, um, what else did I do? Family outdoors, uh, beauty and fashion. So I did, I've done, and I still do lots of, um, I regularly go on to different courses to learn different aspects. Um, but making that jump only happened when my, when my last role as, as employed came to an end. 
um, I was given a redundancy and I took it and I thought, well, this is it. I'm going to spend a bit more time now doing photography uh, professionally. Was that, that redundancy, was that from marketing? Yeah. So you, you were doing marketing for, I think it was law firms, wasn't it, at yeah. the time? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I was working as a marketing manager for a law firm. And, um, and yeah, so I thought this is, this is the time. Let's do it. That was five years ago, so I'm celebrating five years in September. No, oh, congratulations. Thank you. So it's interesting you said that you did lots of different courses and tuition in different aspects of photography. Because a lot of photographers, they don't do any sort of training themselves they just go out and they do it themselves and, and it's the art and they learn and practice themselves how yeah. important do you think it is to study the different aspects and, and learn the different techniques and, and what's required for different types of photography mm -hmm. I think it's, it's very important um, it is important for the technical side uh, but it's also important for the confidence um, because for me at least when I learn from other people and when I learn from people that are established in that field I feel that I am taking part of their knowledge that they have developed over the years and I can make it mine and use it um, in my own way obviously um, but I do find that it's very important um, because some things you wouldn't know or you wouldn't small things for example with um, with outdoor photography for example with, for children uh, things like do not shoot in an open field. You know, it's something you do get to that conclusion yourself, but learning it from an established professional photographer does give you that learning much quicker and you know where to place your families next time you were in a park, never in the open field, but under the, the shadow or the shade of the trees, just on the edge as the trees um, end. So just under that, so that the they're not completely, you know, in the open light, which can be harsh and mm. too bright, or they're in the shade and it's softer. So things like that, for example, that that's, you know, just an example. Oh, that, that's a lighting reason, is it? You wouldn't put them in the open field? Yeah. The lighting reason and also the, the big open field in front of them acts as a massive reflector. Mm. And then it bounces the light back onto them, uh, but they don't have light coming completely from everywhere onto them um, especially on a bright day for example if it's an overcast day it's okay it's fine you can manage but on a bright day it's better to be under under the shadow of the trees just on the edge <laughs> oh interesting tip that's a good tip <laughs> um while, while you were learning from other courses um what was the sort of photography uh, community like in terms of other photographers and people you perhaps looked up to um, I think generally they, the community is very good, it's very supportive, um, very, you know, generally and the people I've met, the people I've worked with, the tutors and the trainers I've, um, I've learned from, they're very supportive um, because everyone, you know, there is, there is a lot of, um, there, is every, there is a place for everyone, so everyone can find their style and it's about the confidence. Once you get your confidence to get going and do the thing you do, then you know you've you've got it. And um, with the right support and the right technique, inspiration, networks, then you know it is you can do it. So I have, I have found the community to be very supportive. Hmm. You you mentioned networks. What sort of networks do you find uh, that are useful for you? Uh, well, so I'm part of a um, a BNI group. Um, that's my weekly weekly uh, networking every week i've been doing it for four years uh five years in fact uh so that's that and then i run a networking group myself where i live in tooting um in southwest london so we meet monthly um and my group has been going on for two years three years now um and then i i have various other groups of people that i network with connect with on a regular basis um yeah what's what's your your networking group what's that about what's the theme so it's a local local business local business networking in two things that's our title um and it's small businesses uh, that either work from home in tooting or have a shop front or rent studio spaces um and they we have a range we have uh people in the um well-being industry um, we have people uh, in the education um, industry we have shops um, uh, what else do we have 
accountants, bookkeepers, branding, marketing, um, cake makers. Um, so various. what 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 prompted you to set up your your own networking meeting? Uh, well, I wanted it to be local, be be you know based where I live, so I can bump into these people, I can see these people regularly rather than online. And it was we started it just before the pandemic, obviously without knowing about it, mm. um, and it proved to be very useful during the pandemic because we then shifted online, um, and we were all you know supporting each other, helping out. Um, and and learning together i think marketing is always a key thing for small businesses marketing social media and social media in particular instagram and all the changes they've always been a hot topic in our group so mm. people have always wanted to share that kind of learning and support each other online as well you know engage with posts and things like that yeah instagram and, and all the social media really they're they're ideal for people who are doing small business and, and yeah. working from home aren't they because it, it just gives you a free avenue out yeah. there now you you mentioned the pandemic obviously you're a photographer which is a face-to-face -face business it yeah. can't really be anything else yeah how did that affect what you do and, and what did you do about it uh well so everything stopped you know um obviously from march 2020 when the famous announcement was made by Boris Johnson, um, we're all at home, so you couldn't see anyone. Uh, but as many other photographers around the world, I also reinvented myself and uh, I did the doorsteps. I was part of um, the doorstep campaign, which was uh, basically to photograph people on their doorstep. I saw some of that. I saw some of that. Yeah, yes, yeah, so I did a lot of that. I did that uh, from April until... Well, almost a year, really, uh, on and off. You know, during the, the the when the restrictions would ease, you know, you you know there was a bit more of a, a free movement kind of thing going on, a bit freer. You couldn't leave, but you could still be on your doorstep, um, and you the photographer could be a few, you know, five, uh, three four meters away and still take the photos of the family. So, and I did that for charity. I raised about two thousand pounds pounds for St. George's Hospital, which is our local hospital, mm. St. George's Hospital Charity. Um, and it was a way to keep it going, keep the job going, um, although I didn't make a lot of money, it was mostly for charity, but there was engagement, You there was more um, brand awareness in a way. Mm. No, that's excellent, that's excellent. Um, you, you mentioned um, also the, the photographer community and how there's lots of work for everybody. Um, you do lots of different types of photography. Is there something that you prefer to do or specialize in? Yeah, yeah. So I do. I there is there are some things I don't do. I don't do weddings, like I don't do big weddings. Very wise. Um, Very wise. <laughs> <laughs> I am not ready to take those on. I mean, I could, but you know, it's um, a full-on thing. Mm. I do small weddings. I do like town hall weddings, like a two, three-hour thing. Um, I do. Um, I don't do drone or aerial photography. Mm. Um, I do underwater, but for myself, sort of for fun. Um, and then the ones I do are portraits. You know, it would be mainly under that category of um, of women, men, uh, for their own use, personal use, or professional use. So mm. headshots. Um, personal branding, and then I do the family side as well, so the babies and uh, outdoors. So the mm. bits I don't prefer a lot are families in the studio, big families in the studio. Um, I'd much rather have them outdoors. <laughs> mm. you, you mentioned um, portrait photography. Uh, I know a lot of people who have very bad photographs on their LinkedIn very bad photographs, uh, at, at, let's say at B&I on their presentation slides, because they don't want to have a professional photograph taken. They're worried about how it's going to look. They don't like the way they smile. Maybe they don't like the way they, they appear. And how do you get over somebody who is afraid to have their picture taken? Mm. Well, so that's, that's the majority of the population. <laughs> okay. <laughs> to start with. I mean, very few people like like themselves, especially in our age group. You know, like if you're talking to the youngsters, they're used to selfies. They know their best angles. 
They know how to pose, how to stand, they know the light. So they're the pros. So working with them is a different thing. Working with, you know, people like us and older, um, it's more about creating a safety, create, creating a safe place you know, at first. So it's creating that safe place where people can, you know, feel themselves or even if they, you know, even if they don't want to feel themselves, then you can at least invite them to accept themselves because mm -hmm. there's a lot of judgment. We have a lot of judgment about ourselves, about our bodies, about how we look. Most of us still think we are 20 years younger than we are. And when we look at our photographs, we realize that, no, we're not actually. Mm -hmm. And it's about time to accept it. I mean, it's a lot of um, photography has and portrait work has a lot to do with self-acceptance, self-love, self-development um, and accepting who you are. And if if in your profession you need photographs of you, then you better accept that early on because it will be a block. And if you don't go past that block, then that mm -hmm. will keep you stuck. Um, so people go round and round and round until they actually accept it and they move on. Mm. They move on to the next level or, you know, whatever they're looking for. Um, so I try and talk, uh, you know, along those lines and and people who get the message, get the message and they come and see me. And then when we actually do the photo shoot, um, it's a chat. We talk about things and I try and get them to actually relax and enjoy um, and or if they don't enjoy it, I'll make it quick. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah. So you, you help people with their, their poses as well, don't you? And, and how to stand yeah. and, and how to, I mean, with me, for example, I don't have a smile really. I've got a very small mouth mm -hmm. and I can't, yeah. it doesn't really That's work. So yeah. how do you get a natural photograph of somebody who like me doesn't really know how to pose in front of a camera? Yeah. Um, well, you don't have to smile necessarily. You don't have to have a big smile. Um, That's useful. You know. <laughs> some people have sure. really big smiles. Some have small smiles. Um, and I say, you know, let's try all of them. Let's try no smile. Let's try mid smile. Let's try big smile. Um, and it's a bit of a play. You know, we will try things out. And then obviously with posing, I will, I usually find people are more comfortable with sitting. Mm. sitting and leaning uh, or standing but leaning on a stool uh, or resting either their hands or their arms somewhere or their legs, their feet somewhere. So if you do a bit of that, it breaks the body down a bit and it loosens up. Um, and I find that the first 10, 15 minutes are just that, warming up. And if we're lucky that there is a couple of good ones in that time, that's good. Mm. Um, but if not, we continue and then at the end of the session, which can be up to 45 minutes to one hour, um, we look back and there will be, hopefully, there will be a few <laughs> that, you know, even you would like, Darren. <laughs> well, I don't know about that. I think my, I think my dislike of um, having pictures taken probably comes from school. Mm. Oh, right. school photography is awful. It's generally awful because oh. I just remember everybody lining up and you all have to sit down and you all have to do exactly the same pose, regardless of whether that pose works for you or not, or what size you are. And I remember one year they had everybody sit down on a chair and put their arms out in front of them on a desk. Yeah. They didn't move the chair. It was the same for everyone. And there was this one kid who was like leaning right forward in an awkward position to reach oh. the chair because he was quite short. Mm. And it was just a terribly awkwardly posed photograph. Oh, dear. And I don't understand why, well, it, it's numbers really, I suppose. I don't understand yeah. why parents are buying those pictures because they're awful mm -hmm. and the kids feel awful and the pictures are <laughs> awful and the <laughs> photographers are charging a huge amount of money for just conveyor belt work. Um, but I think that's what is ingrained in me in having um, a picture taken is like. Like that. Whereas mm -hmm. as, the, as the way you described it, it's more of a, a relaxed conversation. It's more of let's just go out and get to know each other and, and, and do stuff. And by the way, there will be pictures taken yeah. at the same time. Absolutely. I'm, I'm, I think I'm going to write it down because it's always good to hear how other people, you know, <laughs> interpret the words used like, are important. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, very much so. It is, it is that. Yeah. And, um, um, it is, and photography is a bit like that because you look into someone, you know, mm. and you have to let someone look into you. 
um, in a nice way, in a relaxed way, in a safe way. Um, mm. And your reference to school photography is useful, actually, because I can now pinpoint to where for some people that, you know, stiffness comes from or that fear or, mm. you know, school photography. Um, so that could be useful for my next promos. I could say not like school photography. Not like school photography. No, no. It, it, it's the conveyor belt and the, the awkward pose and the one, yeah. sh- one shot, click, right, next. I wasn't ready. That was awful. <laughs> Um, you, you've got on your on the screen I can see behind you, and I've had a look at it on your website as well. You've got a forty over forty campaign. So, do you want to tell me a little bit about that? Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, so, the forty over forty campaign is a campaign that is ongoing. Um, it is for people who are in their forties, fifties, and more, sixties uh, and beyond. And it's, um, I'm looking for 40 people. So it's 40 people over that age, over the age of 40, who are, who have made the decision, who have chosen to uh, be part of the campaign. Um, and the campaign consists in a photo shoot, an individual photo shoot for each person, uh, but also a magazine uh, where everybody is featured with their portrait and, um, and uh, their story, um, and also an event when we reach the number 40, there will be an event uh, with everybody coming along, plus another in, a guest invited by each person, uh, where we get to celebrate, where we get to celebrate the decision that everyone has made to actually go and celebrate a milestone or an achievement or um, getting over something important in their lives um, with a photo shoot. Um, so that's, that's what the campaign is about. Excellent. And and what sort of issues have people got over or milestones have people got over in their lives so far that you've you've taken pictures of? Um, so usually, um, so far, the people that have taken part, um, I'll, I'll mention some examples. Um, one lady is a, uh, a stay-at-home mum from the time she had her children until the children are still young so she joined the campaign because she wanted a bit of a a boost a boost of confidence she wanted to do something different she wanted to reconnect with who she was before having children um she felt she'd lost her sense of style her sense of herself and um she she felt drawn by the campaign because she thought that this would help her get over that and move on to um maybe finding a job, looking for jobs in the future, um, feeling good about herself and then taking mm. the next steps that she needs to take. Mm. And there's some excellent photographs as well. I mean, the, the, the two I can see behind you, oh, yes, and, and, and Maria as well. They're beautiful pictures and beautiful smiles as well, which I, yeah. I, I can't do. <laughs> which I can't do. Um, you mentioned uh, BNI earlier on. What? How are you promoting your business and getting work through BNI? What sort of things are you asking for, and what kind of introductions are you getting? Um, so I think I am one of those people who are on repeat <laughs> <laughs> that do the same. You know, uh, I try and vary it. To be honest, to be fair, mm. I try and vary it and try and make it different. Uh, I try and be um, show what I do as well. So when mm. we have face to face meetings. Um, I'll bring a prop or I'll um, I'll show, you know, what I do, maybe with posing or maybe with taking some pictures around the table. Um, and the type of work I get from I mostly is for teams, so um, for headshots and teams. So that's what I ask the most about uh, for introductions to uh, teams of um, lawyers or solicitors or Accountants, professional services, um, people who teams who are growing and are recruiting people and are looking to um, get headshots of everyone. So I can do those in their offices. Um, so it's convenient for them. I can set up and do the whole team. Um, and I do get introduction to those introductions to those teams um, from time to time. And then people are aware of what I do, so they will recommend me on social media and yeah. to their connections. So. Um, who gives you your your main referrals? Because I'm always interested to know from a, a creative perspective what kind of businesses or what kind of other members are able to refer you well and regularly. Um, so usually it's people um, people who have teams um, who know obviously what it takes to to run a team. So 
um, they will either refer me to their own teams or to other uh, companies they know that have teams. Um, so it's usually the people that are, it doesn't seem to be working very much on like power, power team based kind yeah. of referrals. Um, so it's quite, for me, it's quite varied actually. It's not, I, there's not a regular pattern. It's, mm. I think it goes round and everybody will have something at some point, mm. um, will have a connection that is suitable for me. So it's kind of quite varied where you're getting yeah. your, your referrals yeah, from. It is actually, yeah. 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 Okay. That can be a good thing, I suppose, because you're getting lots of business from different people. And if one person were to leave who was giving you business, it's not necessarily a problem because you've got others that can, you've diversified it basically. At some point, yeah. So at some point, someone else will suddenly say, oh, you know, I made this introduction or I, um, I thought of you when I had this chat. Um, so yeah, so it is quite varied. So I, I, don't, I don't have like a clear funnel but it's it pops, you know. It's like a popping scene, mm. <laughs> <laughs> and it's working for you then. Uh, yeah, it, it does. It does definitely work. Um, I do get, um, you know, quite a few introductions, and um, and it's it's good to be um, working across chapters as well. Um, I had a very good introduction from someone who is not in our chapter and who is not even in London, um, a Manchester-based. Um, someone in a Manchester-based BNI who mm. was looking for photographers in London in BNI. Mm. And that was a very good referral because it was a big team uh, who is growing. So, and that came out of the blue. I had no connection to this person, to this lady. And it was just because I was in the BNI network that, you know, it sort of worked. I've, um, I've, I've seen quite a lot of that, to be honest with you. It's yeah. it's members using BNI Connect. And for anyone listening to this who doesn't know anything about BNI, apologies, but tough. We're going to do it anyway. Uh, yeah. it's, it's using BNI Connect, and if you've got your profile on BNI Connect filled out properly with a good photograph for a start, a good yeah. picture of yourself, and you've got all of your details filled in, and you've got you know your your goals all filled in, and you've got your you've been to BNI training as well because it shows up on the training report, mm -hmm. they're more likely to pass a referral to you than somebody who doesn't have a picture doesn't have a website link, doesn't have anything filled in, it shows that they've not really bothered, they've not yeah. thought about it. Yeah. So yeah. those that fill it in are going to get those cross-chapter referrals from other parts of the country or even other parts of the world. Yeah. I know of um, a company that was referred in Dubai to the UK yeah. because they found them on BNI Connect and they were looking yeah. for somebody that basically gets it yeah. because they'd filled their profile in. They got a referral from Dubai. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That that is it's part of the, it's part of the. Well, it's it's the same, isn't it? It's a it's a network, but it's wider than just your own group. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, people who don't fill their profiles, it's a missed opportunity because, um, it doesn't take long just to add your details. No, it doesn't. And, you know, it's just like a you know you're being referenced on that system, um, and it can only be useful. It doesn't harm. So yeah. Mm. <laughs> Hmm. Um, one one thing I wanted to ask with with photographers with with B and I, and we'll get off B and I shortly. I'm sure about it. Um, with photographers with B and I, one of the big objections that they have to joining a chapter is that they don't know whether they're going to be on a shoot on a particular time, and they can't commit to it because if they're going to a a networking meeting on a regular basis, it means that day of the week they can't travel yeah. to do work. Is that an issue for you, or how did you get over that? Um, well, it has been. It has been an issue when I've had jobs that needed me to be there um, on early in the morning. Our meetings are early in the morning on Thursdays. Um, so I, but I, you know about it in advance, so you can plan and you can uh, find someone to sub for you. Hmm. So that's the way around that. Um, so as long as you know about your shoots a week in advance or two weeks in advance, then you can try and, and plan for someone to be there um, instead of you. Hmm. You know, you could be another photographer. I've used other photographers to sub for me. I know it's not the done thing, oh. uh, but you know, when I've been stuck and I didn't have anyone else, then I don't mind. You know, I, I'm, I'm in good terms with the photographer in question. You know, we're, we're friends. He actually introduced me to, to BNI and <laughs> made, you know, he sponsored my entry. So he subbed for me um in the past and uh, you know people appreciate that you're doing the same job but they also know that you're friends 
and and photographers do pass work to each other as well you know we can't be doing everything so mm. it's good to nurture that your own group of people that support you that's interesting to have someone who is technically a competitor yeah to to sub for you being I've actually I've never thought of that to be honest with you I've never encountered that no that's that's a good yeah, thinking we've done that yeah, yeah. <laughs> um one thing I I do like to talk about with with photographers because this is something I am genuinely interested in is the post production oh uh, yeah mm-hmm. how much work do you do on post production for say a portrait for photograph uh, say a studio portrait um, like the one maybe of Donald you've got behind you and yeah. what sort of software do you use on that what kind of effects do you use. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so I use, as I said earlier, I use uh, Lightroom and Photoshop. So I edit, I process all the images on Lightroom, I import them on Lightroom, and then when I do the individual, um, I do a bit of retouching, so I try not to do very extensive retouching, depending on how people feel about it. Um, say a normal person, say Donald, you know, not uh, very keen on massive retouching. <laughs> um, you know, I'll go into Photoshop and do some tidying up, do some tidying up of the face. Um, usually it's the under the eyes. Um, everyone complains about dark mm. and um, dark under eyes and um, po- um, pockets. Um, yeah. Puffy, and so I'll go in there and I'll I'll smoothen things up a bit and lighten up. Usually makes people look less tired and less worked out. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it, yeah, so that 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 is my regular thing. Um, but it does take me just the processing because I then I have to select, I have to cull down. So from a shoot, a portrait session, a portrait session, I'll have say 150 photos. And then I'll select it down to 70 that I'll show to the client. And then from the 70, I put them on a gallery. They choose. Um, there's back and forths for the choosing. So just that takes a good two, three hours, four hours, just mm. that process. And then once I've chosen, I'll do the individual retouches, and that takes another three, four hours. So it's about, in total, it's about an eight hours kind of editing for a portrait session. Mm. So the, the retouching that you do, is that on the 70 photographs or is that on a much smaller version? Yeah, I just I, I try and do it on the smaller uh, sample. So for the, for the 70, I will color correct, I will crop, I will um, consist, do, have a consistent look across them um, and I'll only show the best ones. I won't show you know, the ones that are not good. Um, and so on those ones, no retouching, so just... Lightroom edits. Hmm. So, what what are you doing in in Lightroom? So, I'm I'm getting quite technical here. What is it that you do to to color correct them? Um, so a white balance. So I'll work on the white balance. Um, hmm. Most of the time, I need to warm them up. Depending on how you set your camera up on your white balance, um, I've. I'm recently on a, on a Sony and I was on a Canon before. Mm. So Sony has less um, Sony. Well, I've set it up to be on the cold. So around 5,000 um, Kelvin. Right. Um, so it's quite, quite cold. Um, so the leaves are quite blue. You know, that's what cold means for non photographers listening. Um, and, um, and then on Lightroom, I'll then warm them up. So I'll go more towards 6,000. Um, carving so the images look a bit more um, warmer tones, some more browny, yellowy, mm. uh, earthy tones rather than um, sky cool tones. That's that's the the color the color um, color toning, um, and then brightness, contrast, uh, softening. I do a bit of softening, tiny bit, just to smoothen oh, yeah. smoothen a bit the you know the the facial traits. Um, what else? And then, yeah, that's the main. Those are the main things. Hmm. When when you're softening them, doesn't that make it sort of alter the the focus ever so? Well, not the focus, the um, the sharpness ever so slightly. Um, no, it doesn't really, because um, the especially with the new Sony camera, the the sharpness is so amazing. Hmm. Um, it's so they're so sharp that um, the, the the tiny amount of softness I do, which is like minus ten really tiny or even less than that minus seven on the scale in Lightroom Um, it doesn't alter the focus no the focus is very clear in the eyes and across the face it's just it just gives a little bit of a like a glow a tiny bit of a glow Hmm. 
I shall have to have a play about with that because I've, mm-hmm. I've, I don't use Lightroom myself. I use Photoshop. Okay. Um, I'm not a photographer though, so I, I don't. Yeah, this is just you know we take pictures of the team, for example, internally yeah. and stuff for social media. Yeah, and what do you do on Photoshop? You just open them up on Photoshop and and then play around there. Play around with them, yeah, and it's very easy to over play around with them. <laughs> and you, yeah, you know, you you apply, you. you adjusting the contrast you're adjusting the levels and then you think oh that looks good that looks good and then you look at it and you think actually i've gone too far with that <laughs> bring <laughs> it, it look- back <laughs> yeah bring it looks a little bit weird now I've, I've changed that way 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 too much um in in terms of uh, the kind of work that you do with with portraits um what sort of clients are you looking for into into who you can can photograph ideal clients now ideal clients um so for portraits um so the 40 over 40 campaign is my key campaign at the moment until i complete it um so i am at about a bit less than half so i've got um 13 14 people on board so i'm looking to complete so um reach the 40 um, so if anyone listening wants to get involved on that, they can they can get in touch with you and, and you'll be happy to get them in, into that straight away. Absolutely. I'll, I'll do a mini interview with them only just to fit, just to see if they fit. No, it's a joke. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, normally, if you're over 40 and you're willing to do it, then you should mm. qualify for the campaign. That, that's the starting point. Um, so the, and the people that are part, taking part in the 40 over 40 are um, professionals that um, are taking the opportunity to update their portfolio of images, um, mm. entrepreneurs, people who have their own businesses uh, or um, either solopreneurs or founders, um, and then also um, people who are like Donald, he was gifted uh, the session by his brother, um, so it can also be gifted um, mm. you know, to a husband turning 40 or to a wife turning 45 or to a cousin turning 50 um, and then these would be you know just normal people um, who can then have the experience of a photo shoot with uh, with makeup mm. with hair and makeup um, and um, be guided be coached um, in the posing and in the photo shoot experience and have beautiful portraits they can show off to their family and relatives and also look back and think wow this is also me, you know, we know <laughs> that me, we know that us, the everyday people that, you know, work hard, but yeah. sometimes you can also be treated and look different and look, yeah. you know, powerful and uh, special. They, they do look awesome. Um, one, one thing I, I was, I was thinking then, cause that when you get over 40, yeah, I understand the, the whole milestone getting your picture taken, but there is a a mental block with some people and with some people i mean like me for example in terms of when you get your picture updated because if you've got a particular photograph that you're using on say linkedin or you're mm. using on your your website you know that if you update it and get a new photograph it's because you are older mm-hmm. and nobody really likes getting older how often do you recommend somebody should be updating their photograph <laughs> <laughs> for well, their promotional? Yeah, no, indeed. Um, I do have a I do have a PDF guide, like a, an ebook that I give away, which is um, a guide to great headshots. Mm. And one of the points in there is that a headshot of you, a headshot of you should look like you today. <laughs> 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 you know, it shouldn't look like you 10 years ago or it shouldn't look like you at a wedding or um, on a night out or um, in all other places that you're trying to avoid the thing. Um, so what I usually say and what usually happens is people do them every every five years. Hmm. Say it's very, for, the, for those that really hate their photos taken and then every two, three years for those that want to be, that are active, um are on board with all the requirements of you know modern day running a business and are actually strong and powerful and they want to drive their brand forward um so those people <laughs> are the willing ones and they do it more often 
Yeah, I uh, mine is well out of date. It's well yeah. out of date. I've I've got a photograph from uh, I don't even want to say when it was. I think it's like 2014 or something ridiculous like that. Um, for some reason, all my clothes have shrunk since then. I don't know what's <laughs> what what's going on. It, it must be just I must be buying cheap clothes. That's the thing. Yeah, yeah, it must be bad washing. <laughs> bad washing, exactly. Overheating the washing machine. That is mm-hmm. clearly the problem. Um, what advice have you got for people who want to become photographers now? Not that you want to be encouraging competition, of course, <laughs> but if there's somebody who thinks, right, I would love to be a professional photographer, how can I get started? Yeah. Uh, no, I don't, I don't mind people, you know, getting started and they can come and help. You know, that's always <laughs> a, good, a good way to start by helping, you know, and learning. Um, so what I would recommend to do is to, to get started, get, get on, you know, do it, launch it, publish it, declare it, say to people that this is what I'm going to do. Um, and I know it's not easy and we always feel subconscious. Um, and it, I think most photographers find the biggest difficulties around lead generation, client, um, client, the steady you know, flow, flow of client, client bookings, client work. Um, but you can, you know, to get to that point, you need to start from the, from the start, there's no, unless you have the best connections in the world and the best recommendations, and that's good, you're lucky. Mm. But if you don't, then you have to start from zero and have a portfolio, do model calls. Um, so call for people to be your models, shoot them for free, or don't shoot them for free, shoot them for a small fee um, and increase your fee until you feel comfortable. And then if you don't, stay where you are, get to the next level of technical work, portfolio work, connections, networking. And then increase your fee if you feel comfortable, and then so on. Um, and then find the genre, find the genre that you really like doing, mm. and 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 shout about that everywhere. <laughs> I think I think the genre, the the niche is really important, isn't it? So, so that people know that that's what you do, that you are a specialist in that, and don't try to do everything from huge weddings to corporate headshots to food photography. Yeah. You you can't specialize in in everything. There's just too much to know about it. Yeah, or or do do that. You know, in the meantime, but don't. I mean, you know, stick to one thing online or what people know you about, and even that can drive more work because people associate you with photography of spe- of a specific type, but they will still think that you might help with other genres, and then you can sift through if they come through. Either you do them or you pass them on to someone else. Um, but I mean, yeah, if it depends on what the need is, you know, when you start. It could be experience, it could be money, it could be uh, connection. So identifying things and following through with that is always the best thing. And then be open to anything that happen- that comes along, that happens. Hmm. Is there a, a particular, say, starter piece of equipment that you think people should have? Well, the camera. <laughs> <laughs> I was being more specific. I was thinking more specific than a camera. More specific, um, more specific. Which type of camera or? Yeah, as as sort of a basic model. If if somebody was thinking, I'd love to have a go at this. I'd love to be a photographer myself and see whether yeah. I'm any good. What's the sort of entry level camera they could have that's going to enable them to do? Yeah. Fantastic quality photographs, assuming they've got the talent. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Um, so I would say the so the all the cropped sensor ones so all the um the dlsr the slrs um so you have the cropped ones um and you have the full frame ones so the the cropped ones are very good you know are very good to start with you don't need a full frame to start with because these days sensor sizes which is um um what used to be the film so the sensor keeps all the information um they're very very high these days um so even with the cropped sensor camera you get a lot of detail and then it's about then doing the focus focusing working on the focus and how to get that focus sharp um so i i started with a canon eos um eos 450d Mm. that was my first camera and i and i was on that for like two three years in and then only in the third year i swapped to the canon 6d which is a full frame um, and then only this year i then moved on to a sony which is a um a mirrorless so the new generation uh, mm. which are smaller and more compact but really really good sensor and really good um focus um but that's a journey and over the five years it took me five years to get to the sony so <laughs> yeah <laughs> It's a great advert for Sony, isn't it? It took me five years to get into Sony, and now I'm here. 
<laughs> Canon is a thing of the past. Well, Canon, Canon is great. They also do uh, uh, mirrorless. They have their beautiful models of mirrorless cameras as well. Mm. Um, but doing the jump from Canon to Sony means that you have to buy the lenses. So um, mm. the Canon mirrorless cameras are a bit more expensive. The Sony mirrorless cameras are cheaper. But um, if you jump across, then you have to buy lenses. So it's sort of you have to you have to you know do the maths on each option well before you jump. I did jump and I bought a new lens at a convention at a big photography um, event, a very good deal, and that's why I jumped because I could buy camera and lens together for a good amount. Hmm. I, I have to ask because I I was in a, a photography. Um, little, little networking get together a while back and the, all the, the photographers because I was in it really for the videography all yeah. the photographers were there comparing the lenses they've got and I think one of them was something like five grand for a lens, lens. Mm. yeah I've, I've, I've got to ask what what what's the most you've spent on a lens you can tell me to shut up if you want to <laughs> I don't mind I don't mind sharing I mean I'm not I'm not as you can perhaps tell I'm not one of those that will you know I don't have the new gear syndrome mm. uh, <laughs> I like that phrase new it's gear got a syndrome. name it is recognized syndrome among photographers you know yeah. the latest shiniest most expensive gear yeah. um so my new my current lens Sony and Sony body and Sony lens are the most expensive purchase I've made and both of them um came to 2500 right that, that's quite uh, that, that's quite reasonable, really. Isn't that? I can see yeah. why you got a good compared deal. Compared to that, <laughs> compared to that, yeah, definitely. I mean, you could spend so much more, definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah you, you, you can also spend so much less. <laughs> yes, yeah. You can go really far down that rabbit hole if you want to get yeah. all the gear. Um, and second hand, I always recommend second hand. You know, to start. Oh. Out. So, you know, my first equipment, apart from that 450D Canon, that was mm. new, but the 6D second hand. And um, secondhand MPB, MPB.com is where right. I buy my second hands from and sell. You can buy and sell from them, um, and which means you can try new lenses and try them out or new bodies. If you don't like it, send it back. You know, mm. you sell them back to them. Um, whereas if you buy a new thing and you're not sure, if the resell value will never be the same as mm. what you paid for in the first place. So it's yeah. a bit of a business de decision you know, to be smart with your finances. Yeah, it's like buying a new car. As soon as you drive it off the forecourt, it's lost half its value straight away. Exactly. <laughs> and then you might not be sure about this, about that, and yeah. <laughs> oh, that's, that's excellent advice. No, that's really good. Um, as, a, as a final question, if somebody wants to get in touch with you uh, to ask you about cameras or to work with you or to do your uh, 40 over 40 campaign, what's the best way they can get in touch? Uh, best way I would say is um, two things, LinkedIn, so I'm on LinkedIn as Laura Shimili uh, with my personal profile, um, the in, my Instagram as well, um, which is um, Laura Photography London, um, and then of course there's the website, the old, um, the old website, um, <laughs> which is shimilimiers.com, um, so the three ways are, are there and I don't know if you, sh if you share at the end, but happy to share my email address and phone numbers. Um, yep. Any, yeah. Anything, uh, any contact details or, or websites will pop into the the description underneath the podcast. So if somebody's watching this on video, it's in the description underneath the video. If you're listening on Apple, it's in the description. So anybody can get in touch with you using the links on there. Lovely. Yes. Okay. Um, yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much for, for joining me today. It's been an absolute pleasure. Um, I loved chatting uh, photography and, 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 and Photoshop with you and, and editing stuff. So thank you very much. I uh, appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much, Darren. Thank you for inviting me along. And um, it was, yeah, it was a pleasure chatting. And um, I will follow, I will listen to the other episodes you have from there as well. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Good. Thank you.